That's a long time ago. Garden Trail Committee. My colleagues are Cormac and June and Jeannie at the back and we're going to start in a few moments but what we'd like to do is invite anybody who's a thirst on them. You're very welcome just to go out and bring it in with you if you'd like to get a complimentary tea or coffee or if you'd like a glass of wine you have to part with a little bit of money. If, if we go back to what it was originally, I suppose everyone came to this region for, for the same reasons. It, it's a beautiful area, we have Kilpatrick, which has a spiritual and I suppose a, an aesthetical quality that everybody is drawn to. And then again, we have the setting here of the Carabag River. This was originally one of the most, I suppose, settled and one of the most sheltered little valleys at the mouth of Clue Bay. So for them two reasons, really, you can see why our ancestors did come here. It is a beautiful place and I suppose, as with myself, I'm glad to be back. So. Start off with, I suppose, what we will go with an aerial shot. This is probably one of the hardest pictures I have to pick of Westport House and for this presentation. I think no matter how many angles over my years as being gardener here and since I've been back, one thing this place has taught me is no matter how long you're here, no matter how many days you're here, there's always something new you find in this place. There was a man who worked here, I think, since from the, what, the day of 16 to 65, Tommy Hertig. And he told me every single day, Oshin, you will find something new. And every single day, I do find it something new. Be it a new room in this house, be it a, a new glass house, which I didn't think existed in the wall gardens, be it a mushroom house that, with a little bit of TLC, will come back to what it was. So I suppose this was, I suppose, one of the hardest pictures to, to get. Every angle of the house, every angle in the landscape is pretty much better than the next. With different light, different seasons, the change, I suppose, is what makes it beautiful. So again, sorry now, this is not a Specsavers ad. <laughs> it's not coming up as clear as I wished with the projector. But here's a north of view. Again, just the central area is the lake itself, and then the house is just to the east of it. Again, one of the typical things, or one of the dominant features of this landscape, maybe come on here, one is its east to west axis and again that was based on the alignment of the valley and the Carabag River and again it's dominance looking out towards uh, Clare Island, Ackle Island, Mulrani and then we have uh, Lewisburg and again Kilpatrick. So again this is what it makes this space one of the most dominant areas. Again back to this idea, the aspect, if you go back to the history of when Gressomadi's clan, the clan itself with I suppose the most historic figure being Grace O'Malley. When she was here, one of the main reasons for the positioning of her fort in this region was firstly her view out towards Clare Island to fend off any invasions and what may be. Again, again it was her seafaring industry close to the sea, but also it was out towards Clare Island. One of her other positions, so I think the mouse up was on Clare Island itself. So again, this is a picture of what we well know is the Tower Fort on Clare Island. On this very site here, there was the remains, and it still remains in the dungeons of one of the original Grace O'Malley Tower Forts. And quite recently, actually today, whilst going through some of the documents, I only found out, and some of you may be knowledgeable of this, if you look off in the distance here, we have a number of beech trees on the main drive. And that is uh, an archaeological feature of what people believe was uh, another tower house and possibly connected to the Grace O'Malley and Tower House itself. So if you go on here, again you can see in the far ground <coughs> I'm going to ask to take a here. It's not working for me. Yeah, you're going to have to bear with me for a second here now. So again, if you see in the distance here, upper this area there's a, a couple of beech trees. So this was and is, and maybe something to look at in, in future years, 
uh, one of, a, a, an archaeological site of historic relevance. Again, one of the other most dominant views is that of the Greek, Propatric. Um, as I go on in, in this talk, uh, pretty much all of the historic landscape architects, um, they looked at the background, the back setting of Clare Island and Propatric as the frame to their garden. And they've seen their garden as secondary to the landscape. So they've borrowed views, and one of them being the most iconic of Cropatric. Again, just to break this down into different layers, and I think it's the most, I suppose, simplistic way of looking at it. There has been a number of layers, and I think it is worth stating that our generation is just another one of these layers. We're not gonna we're not gonna, I suppose, reinvent the wheel. We have the basic foundations here, um, and I think it is our responsibility to further it, to renovate it, and to make it uh, accessible and available for future generations. Again, we're just passing through. So again, it, to get the opportunity to undertake a project like this is, I suppose, you, it's beyond a dream job. It's, it's like Barbados, I suppose, but a little bit more rain. <laughs> so if we go back, I suppose the main rounds, I'm gonna look at it in a kind of a four-stage approach. We had Richard Castle, the architect, in the early 1700s. Uh, then we had James Wyatt, which I suppose what we are here today to celebrate, the 250 years of Westport. He set out to design for what is now the Westport uh, town itself. Then we have the era of the 1800s with the second Marquess of Sligo. And then we have, I suppose, another dominant era was the era during the, the, I suppose, the dominance of the sixth Marquess of Sligo. So again, sorry now, this is coming out perfectly clear on the screen, but as you can see, it's not translating. Again, I can circulate any disinformation. So this is the 1844 maps, black and white maps of uh, the actual estate itself. Again, it's quite unclear, but uh, if you go onto OSI Ireland, go onto historic mapping and zoom in, it's, it's a great tool. You can actually see all the individual pieces of the landscape, and again, all the individual pieces of Westport Town itself. Again, this gave me the overview and the basis of what the landscape makeup is, I suppose, because in its, I suppose, more dilapidated state now, it's more kind of investigation work. This is really the area highlighted again of the domain, the inner domain. The domain itself spread in its day towards Delphi and outwards. So for, I suppose, the essence of this project and the essence of today's lecture, I will be uh, figured more towards the inner domain. Again, this is back to Richard Castle. This painting was by George Moore in 1760. He was a predominant uh, landscape artist of the time. And it, does, it gives an idea of what the main elements of the estate were back when Richard Castle had redeveloped the front of the house. And, and also, he had a number of statements through, through the, the estate. So again, just to break down this painting, I think it gives a lot of information. First of all, you can see in the painting, the house is at the center of the painting. That shows it is the most dominant feature in the painting. But then again, as I was saying, we have Kilpatrick to the left, and then we have Clare Island centered right in the middle. So this gives that east-west axis, and this is what the original, I suppose, architects were looking at and were hoping to fulfill in what we are now living. Again, secondary to this, there is the remains of what seems to be an old tower house. Uh, again, this could possibly have been a folly to do with the estate, or it could have been what may have been the old remains of Grace O'Malley's tower house. If we look further here, we have a dot here. It, it was very faint on this side here. And out in the bay, we have a horse down to the, the bottom right. And in the bay itself, there was two grand tall ships. Again, this would have marked the wealth of the family and also their industrial, I suppose, their industrial work or uh, where they have gained their wealth. Again, the two boats of market that Westport was a, quite a prosperous uh, and is quite a prosperous trading town. And again, then in the field, we had a number of thoroughbred horses. So again, this portrait, not alone does it state the landscape, it also states, I suppose, what went behind the family and what went behind the actual grounds. So go back to the architect himself then, Richard. Not alone, I suppose, did he design the facade we see on the front of the house here, and this area of the house. But I suppose more in keeping with the landscape 
some of those key features were essentially the cascades you see coming in here. They were built in 1735. And also the, the house bridge, which we've just crossed. That's a limestone bridge. It's a four arch. And again, as an accumulation, all these elements create one masterpiece. And the, the bridge itself, um, as I was saying, is what some call, from stonemasons' point of view, quite a masterpiece. If you look at the turrets and the, so the, the breakwaters, the, the angles and the, so the craftsmanship of it is renowned. Again, these are the water cascades. They're not as well known. The, the first one here to your left is, wouldn't be as well known. And it's something we will look at developing a river walk along the river upwards towards the main entrance, towards um, Church Lane. But again, these cascades were created. The first one on your left is to create a more naturalistic approach. And then your one on the right, which is closer to the house here. That was more to show man uh, manipulation of the landscape. I suppose, again, you can see the colonnade uh, essence of the river, like we see in the main town. Uh, one of the biggest statements, again, architecturally, secondary to the house, would have been the stable, the, or the coach house. The coach house itself was built in 1734. Again, it was the house, the cars, the horses, and uh, the, uh, the people who worked on the horses um, within this building. This was the second layer that we're going to look at is James Wyatt. And again, he's most renowned for the layout of Westport Town. It's again what we're here for tonight, the Westport 250. And he was left with the foundations of what Richard Castle created. And again, having our, of the period, Capability Brown was one of the premier landscape architects and landscape designers. During this period, parkland and the natural style was, uh, I suppose, was in vogue, and it was the scene and done thing to do. Um, during this period, we had the development of the lake itself <coughs> in, 18, in 1800. Um, what we see now, we see outside, the artificial lake was dammed. There was the creation of weirs. We had further the creation of two bridges, namely up here at the main entrance, which realigned the main entrance to what we see it now. And also on uh, the back entrance, we also had another bridge created. Again, this was the approach they were going for. They wanted a naturalistic, easy flowing style of capability brown. This again utilised Clare Island and Kilpatrick and nearly assimilated into design to make it feel as if it was all one, although essentially the inner part of it is artificial. During this period as well, there's huge forestry plantations of Oak and namely Beach. And again, during this period, it was noted uh, for the horticultural relevance of the Oak and Beach in this area. Again, we all know the sea spray is, is not the best around here. So uh, having matured, uh, again, an Oak and Beach forest around here was seen in quite a positive manner. Again, this is uh, James O'Connor. And um, this is uh, another painting of the time. Again, sorry for that. The resolution of it is, is not great against the backdrop here. But again, it, you can see the essence of the background, the back setting of Kilpatrick, and again, the kind of naturalistic style of the, the main at the time. Again, this is the parkland setting we get, the kind of free flowing natural style. One of the key aspects of the capability style and the key aspects of the realignment of the actual entrance here, which comes in from Church Lane style, um, would be the creation of viewpoints and vistas. So people, as they were drawn through the main entrance, um, certain, I suppose, certain areas of forest were planted to create aspects and views. You come around the corner, and then all of a sudden you're hit with a glimpse of what is now the house here. Therefore, it gives you the anticipation of what's to come next, and that's what this created. That's also something which, going forward, um, would be great to, to look at the re-establishment of pockets of trees and vistas and views. <coughs> Again, this is a picture of the house in 1800. This would just have been after the lake itself was dammed. So you can see itself, you can see the house here. There's no front terrace. and uh, The lake itself is actually crouching 
inwards on what is now the West Lawn. And here we go here. Capability brown swans in the in the lake. <laughs> They're a feature of all gardens. <laughs> and so this is uh, the view we've come to know and love. Again, it was quite hard back in the day to you could imagine when this is being planned, how to elaborate on what it would be uh, for the landscape architect, for the gardeners, for the landscapers at the time. To tell people this bare landscape, you have a tower house, you have no forestry, no trees you have the actual coastline coming right up to the house. So for us to see it, you know, it's quite easy, we're here. But back in the day, for the people who designed it, to actually have the vision and the, the sight to see this is what can be achieved, I think that's something we really have to think about for future generations. And the restoration of the woodland, essentially. We're at full maturity here in Westport House. I think that is a key feature. And again, for bringing back in the specimen plants, bringing back in the exotic trees. Again, this is one of the, the two bridges. This is up here beside Church Lane between the estate itself and Hotel Westport. Uh, again, this is, sorry again for the, the definition of the, the actual maps, it's, it's quite poor. But this is of the wall gardens itself. This is one, I think, of one of the most exciting projects in, in the estate. The wall gardens itself was one of the larger wall gardens in, in Ireland and it was centred upon or around uh, quite an elaborate array of glass houses and again something which defined these glass houses was the fact that they were terraced. They are on a terrace hill slope which is south facing. Again this is George Ulick Brown in 1912 in the wall gardens and I only realised <laughs> a couple of a while ago that's actually a seagull trying to eat a rat. But how do you know? We forget about that one, right? <laughs> so here we go. Here's the wall garden itself. I think it's well worth a, a look at some stage prior, I think, restoration and post restoration. This, I suppose, is something that's dear to my heart. This is, again, it will be one of, one of the premier wall gardens. Again, you can see the wall itself to the right. It's built of limestone, which was all quarried on site throughout the estate and throughout the woodlands. Again, it's something I keep on finding. I only found one last week up in the woods up around behind here. There's all, all the stone for the house, for the wall gardens, uh, for the stables, for everything was quarried here on the estate. And a local tradesman and travelling stonemasons um, used to come to the area uh, whilst the project was happening. Again, you can see the sheer volume of stone that was used. Again, these gates to, to the left here, these are wrought iron gates. Them in themselves are a, they're a masterpiece. They're the size, the wall gardens is quite vast. I suppose you all remember it as the bear cage, the monkeys, <laughs> the llamas, <laughs> Nelly the elephant, all the rest. But uh, at the moment, there's huge, huge potential. You can see here to the left hand side and bottom, that's the remains of one of the glass houses. This is one of the more minor glass houses in the estate. Again, this was, this is one of the terraced glass houses um, on the left hand side here. You can see the little arch here, which was used, I presume, for the, the root structures of the grapevines to come outwards. Uh, along the back wall, we still have a lot of the wires and the cast iron, or the wrought iron railings that are still there. On to your right hand side here, uh, we still have, this is steps down into what was uh, the heating facility for the actual glass houses. The old boiler is still intact, the steps are still there. There's a number of potting houses beside it which still have the trays from the original glass houses. This is the old workers' cottages here, which backed on, which is the backside of some of the original glass houses. Again, some of them are in quite reasonable condition, and you can still get the sense of what the place must have been like when it was a functioning wall garden. Um, to your right hand side then, we have uh, what, I, what I believe to be, and what I've told to be in the past, is a mushroom house. Again, this is quite rare. It is concrete structure on the outside, so I do feel that this may have been manipulated or reconstructed at a later stage. But again, inside that, you have full shelving units, as if the garden is just up and left. You can nearly see the mushrooms, but there probably is plenty of mushrooms in there. But, uh, then we come on to a later stage here, uh, the second Marques, 
I suppose this is more of a functional stage. This is when the farmhouse buildings was created and the development of, I suppose, the more industrial side of the, the estate itself. But in saying that, this allowed for future marquesses to actually have the money for, I suppose, the future stages of the, the landscape development. Again, apologies for the, the maps. But this is what we all know as the farmyard buildings. These are one of the most extensive farmyard buildings in the west of Ireland and also in, in Ireland as well. Again, during this time, there was slight renovation of the West Lawn, which is behind me here. And this was known as the, the Pleasure Grounds. In coherence with this, there was development of a numerous pathways through the woodlands. So this would have been more so a parkland um, escape, I suppose, for the residents of the house. It allowed them to walk around the lake, it allowed them to enjoy the forestry and the walk all along, I suppose, the domain wall and back around along the river. And again, that's something which we, we would hope to uh, look at in the future. It's a very minimal statement, but with the density and the quality of woodland we have here, that's a resource that not many places have and not many places can enjoy. So it's definitely something for the future to know. Um, I suppose this is the most recent period, and I suppose the one which we'd be most familiar with. This is again under the sixth Marquess's rule, or period here in the house. Uh, and as I was saying before, the funds came from previous industrial development of the farm. This is a picture taken of the just stated Italian egg garden towards the west of the house. Again, this was vogue at the time throughout Europe and throughout England and within Ireland. And there was a revival of the Italianate style and caught more of a movement from capability brown style towards this more strict, um, defined, and ge uh, stuff for words here now. Geometrical. <laughs> Geometrical uh, way of thinking. Again here, this is a, a view you may have seen before. This is taken just post the renovation. Again, a picture like this, there's so much to take from it. Uh, we can see the expanse of the lawn at the front of the house was a lot further out. And what I, what I feel is there was a haha -ha line uh, probably out towards that front lawn to allow the view straight out onto the parkland. <coughs> Again, you can see at the back of the house the Italian egg garden. And then we also have a bridge, a second bridge, pedestrian bridge, crossing over to what is now the, the railway line, the train line. This was originally ladies' walk, and it was used for the ladies of the house. to stroll along the river. And then also there was an avenue created um, back up towards the farmyard, which the remains are they're still there. Again, this is a zoomed up version. Again, with photos like this, the picture tells a thousand words. Essentially, the design is done. What we have to do is, was in the future is possibly the reinstatement. Again, here's today's picture of what it is. Um, Again, that's the terrace as we know it. Again, the park line. This is quite an interesting shot. In the background, uh, it's something which pushed me till, I suppose, this afternoon. Uh, we have a plantation of Sicca spruce. The Marquess, the six Marquess, not alone did he do the Italian egg garden, he had quite a, an interest in progressive forestry. And the Sicca spruce in the background, which is actually just behind the wall garden itself, was an experimental plot of Sicca spruce. <coughs> And in Ireland, that is actually one of the oldest plantations of Sicca spruce. Now, what we know it as today is the more commercial forestry. But here, the setting of it, and when you actually go up and walk around it, it nearly feels as if you're in Washington State or back where the origins of Sicca come from. It, it has a different feel to, uh, I suppose, the normal plantations which you would be used to. So, I suppose the future of the estate. Again, we're custodians of this estate. We're only passing through. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, but yet, what we are given, it's, it's magical. So we need to pass this on to future generations. And I suppose do it in the correct manner as well. You know, the, the correct restoration is key and vital. But also, I feel, why not put our own generations, I suppose, stamp on it in a place that may be appropriate? Without, without, I suppose, taking away from what is here and what is the actual Westport House estate. So I suppose there's a few key areas which may be looked at in the future. Again, the lake. 
that will be one of the primary features. Secondary, the Italian egg gardens. Third, the wall gardens. I think you'd all agree that will be, I suppose, beyond fabulous. Uh, number three, again, will be the park landscape in front of us, the restoration and uh, the correct forest management for the future. Uh, number, I suppose, five, uh, or sorry, number four, I skipped, the river walk. Again, that's a facility and a natural beauty that really has to be elaborated upon. It's there, it's just ready to be used. A simple path, a simple design to show people this is what we have and just enjoy it. Uh, number six, uh, again, the actual forestry itself. Some people actually think, or I nearly personally think, that is what Westport is. Every tourist to the town, one of the key features obviously being the actual town itself, the arrangement of it. But coming up that key, the key wall, the actual greenery in an urban environment, it civilises everything. It brings everything down to a more natural, I suppose, style. And then number seven, the actual key wall itself. That being a feature and it markets exactly what it was, the historic value and a sense of place. People of Westport, I suppose, associated, probably unknown to themselves, <coughs> that key wall and the actual domain is part of what we are, essentially. Now again, there's 110 other fish projects, but that would be an overview of what I feel is the most important aspects of, of the house. Now again, as I said, I could go into the minute detail, but I hope that's given you a, a, quite a, a broad understanding of how the actual estate, the layers work, and I suppose where we fit into it. So, thank you. <laughs> so, no curve balls now. Be <laughs> <laughs> nice. There was a talk last night about uh, water quality, fresh water quality, <coughs> and a big discussion about the Mad River. Could it be integrated into this plan? I wouldn't see why not. Why not? It seems ideal, One piece to the other, they're, they're mm. interlinked. Mm. Again, I suppose as you well know, there's a number of uh, species in here which we're, we're not too fond of. So, and that would go towards again the lake. The lake is an artificial lake. Uh, everything will always try to, nature will always try to go back to what it what it was. Um, again, a lake like this, due to the silt build up, there's a number of um, Canadian pond weed and another other species that are in there. But again, that would be looked at in correlation with, with the mall. It is essentially it's all in one. The mall was really pollinated artificially, and the lake was created artificially. So you know there would be. Another quick one. Uh, your church up there with all the headstones and all that. Can, can you see that being the head? The, Graveyard, a little graveyard. Can you see that being restored and put back together? I, I, I would. It, it is a key feature, mm -hmm. definitely. There's a lot of people in there. Are there? There's, there's plenty of people in yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Some which I suppose don't want to be dug up either. But, but um, like no, I would. It, it's surprisingly, uh, it's surprising how many people, I suppose, like graveyards. But it's more for the historic value yeah, of it. Yeah. Again, if you go up to the graveyard, um, <coughs> I suppose I didn't touch on it because there's. 110 other things in this estate. But the graveyard itself, if you actually look at the craftsmanship and quality of the actual stone, headstones, tombs that are in there, it is definitely something worth celebrating and it is something we will be looking at. Yeah. Um, is there a timeline? You have the time yet of 
how many years it's going to. <laughs> how many ways it's going to cash? Not such yet, no. no, 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 no. Yet. It's basic uh, master planning at the moment. Mm. We feel, I suppose, if we get the correct master plan in place, everything falls together. Mm. But I suppose my way of looking at it is if you pick off one job without considering the next, then all of a sudden there, there may be a conflict. Mm. So get the, get the overall picture correct. Essentially get the setting correct and then work out everything mm. right. So there wouldn't be a timeline. No, so you're not under pressure to do it in five years. Right? <laughs> 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 I'm familiar with them. Again, that will be looked at in the master plan. There will be. Um, I was out in Garbalong Island last week, looking from the other side, and the potential there. There's, there's, I suppose there's too much potential to, to let it idle. Definitely. You couldn't get somebody a saw to cut the two or three that's grown off the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've well, attempted it myself a few times. <laughs> Come in next week, yeah. yeah. I'll do it for you. So. <laughs> I do, yeah. And it wouldn't take an awful lot to no. clear a lot of those paths. I know a lot of them can or, 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 or have been broken into or broken into your thing. But I would like, you know, I'd say a decision on that. Again, if, I suppose the way I would look at it is more kind of detective work. Yeah. If you look out on the West Lawn, you actually, if, if when you wander around the house there this evening, go down to the dining room, look out the West Lawn, and you can see the actual remains are essentially, it's a dryer patch where the paths were and you can see the grass is growing greener and higher, and that is the imprint of the original Italian name, Pathways. So again, I see the same up in the woodland. And you see it mostly during the winter time, yeah. everything is dead, you, you definitely yeah. see the plants. You can nearly see, as you run up towards the wall, you can see the original lines. People are still, I suppose, following their, their, their desire on this, essentially. Um, but no, definitely. I think the woodland paths as well, is, it's an easy win project. The actual project, it's, it's there, it's fully mature. All we have to do is let put in the path. It's that simple and don't elaborate on anything. Let, let the, the actual forest be the feature and let the path be secondary. You know, we're, we're walking through it and enjoy it. Definitely, yeah. I think, were you able to uncover much detail about the old water garden and the glass houses? That's one thing we were unable. So. For today's presentation, again, I went to OSI Ireland. Um, there was a report done in 2003 by Blackwell Associate Architects and Belinda Joe. Um, and all the other sources, I've, I went quite deep. Um, also, Sheila Brown, um, we, we've asked her, which there is no records, or we can't find as of yet, and if anyone has them, please, I love them, of the actual wall gardens. We have the OSI map, but it's at a, a large scale, so it doesn't give it in detail. Yeah. That's one of I can't, pictures, that, that was the only picture I could find today. No, it's kind of one of the mysteries. No photographs. Yeah. I, I suppose if I do root deeper, I'm going to start going through the archives in the house. Yeah. And again, as far as I know, most of the actual drawings themselves, the originals, mm. were given to the National Library. So I'm spending maybe a week up there and jig deep. Are there plans to integrate wildlife into the estate, or will that just naturally follow on from what you're planning to do, habitats or not? I suppose, um, <coughs> as you're saying, the naturalisation of the, of the actual estate as it is, but there'll be no direct plans for introducing, you know, directly species into the, into the estate. But definitely, one of, one of the key areas I'm looking towards, and I, uh, I worked myself uh, for a year with Dublin City Council as a landscape architect, um, a lot of historic restorations, I suppose, namely, and which has given me a lot of experience here, was Marion Square and Mountjoy Square. But what we were doing in them areas, and what I've seen from study tours to the UK, and one of the parks which I couldn't believe was High Park. What they're allowing for, for nature, uh, both for nature and both for, I suppose, maintenance, they're allowing quite vast areas of, on, I suppose, unmown, grassland to develop 
But by creating designs through manicured grassland, it looks to be a created, I suppose, designed area. So for, I suppose, the layperson that mightn't understand it, they see it as a design. We understand it, that it's actually creating less maintenance, but it's bringing in the insects. And I suppose, I think, personally, it looks far more aesthetically pleasing. And something like that could be explored out on the front lawn. We could have a, an area of, I suppose, sculptural meadow, and therefore that allows in these birds, butterflies, corn break, whatever we can actually get in. Did salmon uh, go up this river ever? There was fish jumps on all of them, yeah. Right. So no, I know, there was, there was this talk last night, they were talking about that. Mm, I and wouldn't and know, they said it, they said per se. There's did definitely, I've seen a big trout jumping up there, it must be about four pound mm. last day, so there's plenty in there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, yeah. Like I think it would be remiss of us not to acknowledge the custodians of this house and estate from the last century, 20th century to the 21st century. And of course, it goes without saying that we wish the future custodians um, every good fortune and fair winds. And I'd also, uh, on behalf of the Kube Garden Trail, on behalf of Cormac and June and Jeannie, we'd like to thank Biddy very much for her warm welcome and facilitating this tonight, helping us to facilitate it, and to Joan in particular, and to Catherine outside who looked after us um, and gave everybody such a warm welcome. And I know we'll all be back for the next talk of Sheen, which I think is going to be about the future plans. So we're looking forward to, to hearing more. Thanks very much to you and to everybody who came today.